And welcome to NDK 2015. I'm here with JJ with Read Only Memory. Uh, it's a new game. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, about two weeks ago. About two weeks ago. Uh, there's there's a mystery. There's this sort of like futuristic punk world. Can you talk about it? Yeah. So uh, Read Only Memories is based in uh, the year 2064 in Neo San Francisco, and uh, you play as a journalist whose apartment is broken into by the world's first sapient robot, and. Uh, their creator, who's an old friend of yours, has gone missing. And you're supposed to try and figure out uh, what the connections are between their disappearance and the mega corporation that they work for and sort of the, the bigger underlying uh, conspiracy uh, underneath all of that. Um, one of the things I really love about the game is the characters and the diversity of characters uh, within the game itself. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, right off the bat, whenever we made this game, we wanted to make something that showed diversity and inclusiveness, uh, right down from the, the characters to the fact that you can create your own sort of persona in the game. It's all first person, so you never really see yourself, but you can customize it to where you can have your own uh, name on your own gender pronoun, which is more than just he, she, uh, it's they, user, and even custom pronouns if you want. Mm. Uh, and for whatever reason, we put in uh, diet, and I don't think we really ever used that in the game at all. Wait, wait, so like, like, like you can do like omnivore, vegetarian? Like yeah, yeah, uh, or kosher, kosher. Uh, or my favorite, which I always choose, is uh, goddammit Turing. <laughs> and and that'll stick if you really? go with that, yeah. Nice. Um, and, but we never really used it. In one of our newer updates, it's actually going to affect one of the puzzles in the game. Oh, really? Um, mostly the drink puzzle, because there oh, okay. are. So if you're like kosher or vegan, uh, you might not be able to like have a drink that has dairy in it. Right. Yeah. That's really that's really incredible. And I know like you have you have like a cast of characters that are just like that are more than just diverse. They're deep. They have like sort of like their own personalities, characters, more than just sort of like these, you know, broad strokes as you often see in a lot of games. Can you talk about like some of the, you know, work that went into actually developing those characters? Um, so we really wanted to sort of emphasize on the idea of these are these are people that are real. They're, they're definitely not just your typical video game trope character that's there to fulfill whatever requirement you have to advance the game. Uh, we wanted them to feel like these are people that you can always come across on the street of San Francisco 49 years from now. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, our, our writer is very wordy. But, uh, but they definitely do uh, nail the, the, the realism in those characters and, and sort of the deep uh, dialogues and, and sort of layers that they have. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's not just, they're not just like categories. They're not just, you know, this person is, you know, these five things, but it's actually, it feels like they have like wants and needs and they, there's, you are actually stepping into a world. And to speak about that world, uh, the world itself is, like you said, sort of the San Francisco of the future, but still yeah. has that, that feeling of uh, Blade Runner. Yeah. Uh, sort of uh, looking at it from like a, from the distance, but like in the future. Can you talk about sort of like how you built the world around it? Um, so whenever I wanted to make sort of a cyberpunk adventure game, uh, we were thinking of things like Snatcher and Blade Runner, um, but whenever it comes to those types of cyberpunk adventures, uh, they are super outlandish whenever it comes to technology right. uh, advancement. And I figured, well, this is only going to be about 50, 49 to 50 years in the future. Uh, technology gets smaller and more compact and more subtle. 
So we're not going to have these giant flaming towers or anything like that. Like Whoa, wait a minute, what is, where's my giant flaming tower going to come in? <laughs> and no, is that going to be DLC? Uh, what maybe it'll be DLC. Oh, love maybe, it. maybe 10 years down. 10 years, another 10 years. In another 10 years, we'll have giant flaming, towers. giant flaming towers will spring up and we'll have flying cars finally. And no. maybe hoverboards. Hoverboards. Maybe. Tons of hoverboards yeah. all over the place. And those self-drying jackets in case you ever fall into a pond or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, no stains or anything. You can just be perfectly dry and fine. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, I really, it's, it's both futuristic as well as familiar. Yeah. As, as you, you put it. And, and the thing is about this game that it's, it's a good story. It's a fun trip. It is something you want to get into. How hard is it to sort of put put fun as well as this, you know, all these other things that you want to do with the game? Like you want to show off diversity, you want to show off that. Because a lot of people say you can't do both, and you've obviously shown you can make a game with both. Um, hmm. It's a hard one. Uh, <laughs> like. When you're when you're going through and you're you're designing the story mm. in my like how how do you figure things out? How do you sort of put things together? Are you conscious all the time of the characters or do the characters come naturally? Uh, I think it's so I wasn't the person that did the writing. Sure. Um, but the whole team is looking over the script and we're always trying to be very conscious of the characters. Uh, whenever it comes to like, how they're acting, uh, whether or not this line is, is uh, natural or possibly problematic, uh, it's we're definitely very uh, aware of the characters as it's, as they're being made. What are you What are you most proud of for, about this game? Um, since I did all the art, I'm pretty proud of the art. <laughs> um, I always think it could look better. But uh, that's just me always wanting to improve what I've done. Uh, but I'm really, really proud of the narrative and the game. Uh, it's definitely one of the strongest points. Uh, it's very deep. Uh, it's something that's a little different from the typical sort of point and clicks that you would have back in the early 90s. Um, yeah. Um, and you mentioned just briefly that there's like a, an update that's going to be coming out. So is, are you constantly working on like new puzzles, putting in like new stuff, or is it just like smaller tweaks along the way? Uh, so they're, they're always, there's always room for improvement. And uh, with this newest update and any uh, other updates that we might have in the future, we're going to be slipping in uh, extra content for things like uh, Right now, in our demo here, uh, we have an arcade cabinet that you can access in Stardust. And right now, what's on Steam, it just gives you a description of the cabinet. Oh, uh, really? But now, you can play it. Um, and it's just a short mini game that lasts maybe a minute. Mm -hmm. But it's still like something new that people can try out if they want to go for another ending and see something new. Um, some art tweaks here and there, maybe some puzzle balancing tweaks. Uh, and adding a couple more kind of puzzle elements to it to, to break it away more from being kind of labeled as a visual novel and even more a, a graphic adventure. Interesting. Uh, so uh, where can we get this game right now? So you can get it right now on uh, Steam, uh, Itch.io, uh, GOG, and Humble. And uh, there is a demo available. And the demo goes through the prologue in chapter one, and the saves can cross over into the whole game. Well, there you go. Uh, download the demo right now for read-only memory. JJ, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much.